You're listening to The Itch, a podcast exploring all things allergy, asthma, and immunology. I'm your co-host, Courtney, a real-life allergy, asthma, and eczema girl. And I'm your second host, Dr. Payal Gupta, a board-certified allergy, asthma, and immunology doctor. Courtney and I hope to balance each other out so that we get you all the information that you want and need about allergies, asthma, and immunology. Hi, guys. Today, we talk to Sharon Wong from Nut Free Walk. Sharon is an allergy mom of two who blogs about recipes, cooking techniques, Asian ingredients, and food allergy-related awareness and advocacy. We set out to talk about how culture and food are intertwined and what you can do to engage in this with your food allergies. This is a big topic for me because I'm half Chinese, and among my allergens are soy and sesame which means getting to know Chinese culture through food comes with some very clever alternatives. Together with Sharon, we talk more about this, and we also chat about how to navigate the holidays and how you can communicate your food allergy needs to the family, especially if that might impact traditions. We also talk a little bit about potlucks because those are always an interesting thing to navigate when you have food allergies. So let's jump on in. Sharon, super excited to talk to you and let's just jump right in. So can you tell us a little bit about why you started your blog? Oh, yeah. So uh, when my son was really little, he asked me to um, share all my recipes with him in a cookbook. And uh, he told me that his favorite foods are Asian foods. And so I'm really glad that he gave me a heads up to get started because it's taking me a long time and I still haven't had a cookbook. But I'm really thankful that I have my blog so that they can just look at recipes as needed. So my blog is called Nut Free Walk, Allergy Aware Asian Fair. And the whole idea is to share recipes that are nut free, but also to teach people how to adapt some of the recipes to be gluten free or adapted to be shellfish free or egg free or dairy free as I know how. I mean, sometimes I just don't know how and I can't. But but whenever I know that there's a really easy way to adapt it, then I share how to do it. So it's been really fun uh, and very useful for my family as well, because when I go away, they uh, look up a recipe of their favorite meals and then they're able to make it when I'm not home. My son that asked me to write a cookbook for him, he's like uh, off in college now and he's actually using their recipes. And for instance, he's been making fried rice with his friends and he calls them fried rice friendship parties and they all make six batches of fried rice and then they all share it and and it's just really a wonderful way to share our food and our culture and our experiences and to have that time together and uh, sharing a meal. That is so adorable. I think that you attended a food allergy bloggers conference and that's when you really realize that other people might be interested in it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And um, one of the common advice that people uh, receive from their doctors is how to avoid their allergens. And they're always told, oh, don't eat Asian foods or don't go to Asian restaurants. You know, that's really hard advice to take, especially if you're Asian and that or if you really like Asian food. People would ask me, Sharon, how do you make your Asian food recipes? So then I realized that there was a real demand for allergy where Asian fare, where people can you know learn how to make their Asian recipes without their allergen. So that's how I got started. And I realized that there was such a demand for it. And uh, it's been really fun to share the recipes and the cultures with readers. How much do you feel like food plays a role in culture and identity? And whether you think that's one reason people are loving your blog and also how do you, you know, identify culturally with food and with your children's food allergies? I think that food and culture go hand in hand because, you know, like for us, for me, for when I was growing up, I have a huge family and my aunts and my grandmother would make, you know, 20 different dishes and we'd have 60 people under one roof and it's so much fun. And we had all these different uh, traditions and different reasons to get together. And it's so much part of my identity as an Asian, a Chinese American person growing up in San Francisco. And I think that it evokes good memories and it's the traditions that we want to pass on to our children. You know, sharing 
sharing that with our kids actually really makes a lot of sense because they may someday have their own families and they may marry into other families that really celebrate it or very traditional. And so they should have some familiarity with their food and their cultures and they shouldn't be limited by their allergies. And at least they should be able to identify, oh, look, this particular dish traditionally has peanuts. Maybe I shouldn't eat it, but mom makes it without it, but I probably should avoid it this time. So I think that that kind of awareness helps them and it helps them to be able to be smart about what they eat and to uh, still be able to fit in with people that love them or want to be with them. Yeah. And so one thing that you mentioned that I just had a quick question about was you said that there's certain dishes that you know contain certain allergens. So is there a way for somebody who is going to a Chinese restaurant to know which dishes they should particularly be aware of or just asking? Is that what you recommend doing? I think asking would be the first step. That's probably the easiest thing to do. But if you want to be really, really sure, it's probably good to read a cookbook. Um, And I don't mean that, you know, to be sarcastic or anything, but literally true. So like, for example, I'm not very familiar with, say, Korean cooking, or maybe I don't know all the dishes for Indian food. And so what I would do is I would read a Korean cookbook, and I would just read through the whole thing and I'd say see okay this kind of dish would have chestnuts in them or this kind of dish uses pine nuts and so then I kind of make a little list of the names of those dishes and what the what are the major allergens are in those dishes and I just kind of keep a little log so then that way when I go to a restaurant I'll look through their menu and then I'll see if there's any dishes that are like this particular dish uh, or that are is called that particular dish. So then that way I know, okay, this traditional dish contains these types of ingredients. And then I know to ask. That. And another thing that you can do is you can just use Google Translate and translate your allergens to uh, the language that you need. Like say, you know, you're going to go to a Thai restaurant. So you can just t- translate your allergens into Thai and then you can show them just in case, you know, there's any language barriers. If you can just show them a list of your allergens in their language, language, I think that that would facilitate their understanding because when I've done that and I've taken my little list of our my children's allergens to like a Chinese restaurant, they look at it and they're like, oh, no problem. I got this. You know, they totally, totally understand. And it's really super helpful. And then the other thing, too, is that I found that as we go out to eat at these ethnic types of restaurants and I talk to them about our children's food allergies, they're like, oh, we get it. You know, my child has food allergies allergies or my nephew or the, we have lots of customers. So their awareness and their understanding is actually um, much, much deeper than we would anticipate because they are living it as well. It's really interesting to hear, actually, because a lot of the times you think of certain ethnic cuisines and you just think, okay, not possible. With my allergies, not possible. So you don't even venture there. But because there is this awareness that is starting to be generated and it's really impacts so many people, food allergies impact so many people that they are maybe aware and you can potentially experience that food when you thought it wouldn't be. Like, I know that I generally just like stay away from certain types types of foods because I'm I just see it as like a red flag. But you're right. When you know more about the food and the culture, then you have a better way of in going into a restaurant and expressing your your allergies and feeling confident in managing your allergies there. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I remember that time that you and I went to lunch, Courtney. It was so much fun. And I really loved watching you, you know, as a young adult with food allergies to show here's my chef card. These are my allergies. Can you help me pick out something that might work for my allergy? Right. And I thought that is such a great example of how to be an empowered adult dining out. And you can do that by going to an ethnic restaurant as well. They totally get it. So, so, so helpful. So I think that the more uh, knowledge that you bring into the situation by check out a book from the library and just kind of go through the recipes and kind of familiarize with the way they make it and what the recipes are. Like, for example, picking out a dish that you would like to make. And then that's just like picking out a dish that you would like to order. And then the other thing is to to bring in the vocabulary 
through using Google Translate or a chef card that's translated into the language that you need. Yeah, and that's also very helpful for travel too. If you're thinking about traveling somewhere and you're not sure if like you can go to this country because your allergen is quite present, if you really do that research and look into these things, it may may make that possible for you. Yeah, absolutely. And then there are certain cuisines that are a little bit more challenging. There are certain dishes, certain cultures and cuisines that use a lot of milk or they use a lot of sesame or they use a lot of wheat or something like that. Then I think in those situations, it may be, it may not be the best fit, but maybe, you know, there are some you know, recipes that could work, but depends on the severity of your allergies. And, you know, like if you can't even walk into the room and not have a uh, allergic reaction, then maybe those cultures would not be a great fit. But but if you know you can be in that presence of the allergen and you just need to not eat it or not have cross contact with it, then that might be okay. So it just depends on the person too. That's great advice. And I think that, you know, just heading into the holiday season, thinking about family, how do you communicate your needs with family when it may impact or change family traditions? How is that played out for you or has it not been an issue? Well, you know, I think earlier on when my kids were first diagnosed, fortunately, I didn't have all the tools that I needed to participate fully. So sometimes we opted not to go and regretfully as uh, my kids got older, I fully understood for our journey. My son was uh, diagnosed right before he was three. And at first we were told he's just allergic to peanuts and tree nuts. And then six months later, we added other allergens. And six months later, we added other allergens. And we kept adding allergens. We finally realized he was allergic to over 30 things. And then gradually, he outgrew them. But um, it was a very overwhelming time to be managing 30 allergens. And how do you explain that to family members who, you know, having trouble understanding the concept of food allergies in the first place. So we didn't participate as fully as we wanted to. But later on, when we realized that, okay, only peanuts and tree nuts are the things that we can't even walk into a room with, then we asked our family to refrain from serving things with peanuts and tree nuts. And then that made it a lot easier. And uh, so then we were able to go to family events. And I have one aunt. I would tell her, and she's like, no problem. You know, I won't make anything with peanuts or tree nuts. And that's so reassuring and so loving and welcoming. Oh, that's nice. So sometimes you have people in your family that cooperate more than others. And I think that's probably going to be the scenario for a lot of people. And so your recommendations are to talk to everyone, to let them know and communicate your needs and then see how responsive people are. But were you also bringing most of your dishes or... (laughs) I totally did. (laughs) Yeah, I would totally bring, I'd ask my kids, what do you want to share? (laughs) And, um, you know, what what would be something that you you would like to eat that would make you completely, totally happy and make your tummy full and that we can bring to share? And sometimes they would be like, we would like you to bring Spam Musipi. I'm like, okay, you got Spam (laughs) Musipi. And my family who's Chinese and all my aunties and uncles who've never been to Hawaii are like, what is this? <laughs> but, you know, uh, one, one suggestion that I have is, you know, in this day and age, there are so many people with food allergies. Like, is it one in 13 or one in 12 kids? And is it what? I don't know what percentage of adults, but it's a lot, right? I think it's reasonable to ask you know, before the event to ask, hey, you know, we're allergic to peanuts and tree nuts, but, you know, I just want to check to see if anyone has allergies to other allergens. And you you can lead that way and then give other people who may not have found their voice to share about their allergies and so that everybody can be included. I think that's really a nice way of including it is to also give onus on everyone else being like, these are my needs for this holiday gathering. Does anyone else have any particular needs that I can cater to? So it's not just saying you have to do this all for me, but it's like, what can I do to accommodate you as well? Yeah, mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, because maybe someone has this like extra special dish that they've really been wanting to show off during the holidays 
days and maybe it does contain the allergen that unfortunately someone's not allowed to eat. And maybe you could say, okay, let's still include that, but let's keep it in a special space in the home so that it is served at a certain time on maybe different plates and it's not being passed around near my son or daughter. And that would make us feel comfortable. And then that way you can still share the special thing that you know how to make. Maybe something like that would be a nice way to kind of accommodate. Yeah. Yeah. So after many, many years of like, you know, doing potlucks and helping out at uh, school, uh, one thing that I've learned, one little trick that I've learned is to put the more allergen free items that are maybe top eight free or nut free or whatever you know the allergy free things in the beginning of the buffet line and then put the high allergen items at the end of the buffet line just to prevent cross contact so that the people who have the most allergies can go through the first half and still be able to get their food and then there's less cross contact with them and then as you get to the end you know people are going to put their little scoop of whatever on top of something and their serving spoon is going to touch their plate and that's how cross contact happens towards the end of the um, the buffet line. You know, that's one tip. If you're going to have a family gathering and there's going to be allergens present, then just put them at the end of the food line. Yeah, that's a really good tip with my family because we do have holidays where allergens are present we will either have me serve myself first before anyone's allowed to come into the room with the food I'll get my I'll make my plate first uh, from the buffet or before we even take food out to the table I'll make a plate uh, and then everyone else can have their food so that I make sure that there isn't any cross contact because I know that the serving spoon hitting the plate on to an allergen and then going back into the rest of the food is it happens like 100% of the time by the end of the night. So we always make sure that I have the safe food and then everyone else can enjoy. So that's a good tip. Yeah, it is. And then the other thing that can happen is uh, I've seen some relatives do this. They take their one serving spoon and it goes into several dishes. <laughs> It's inevitable, I think, at a potluck. (laughs) You can't keep it as clean as you want. If I was like a new family and I was just diagnosed, how would you want to start that conversation with your family if if they don't understand what food allergies are and you have some special needs for the family potluck or for just the family get together? How do you think they should start that conversation? What kind of tips would you give a new parent from all of your experience now? I think that trying to be relatable is probably the most important thing you can do to kind of open up the dialogue and um, you know you can start with oh we went to the hospital recently so or so my son had a reaction and we had to go to the hospital because of and then describe the circumstances because it's a legitimate concern if you've had some sort of incident and you can describe what happened and then that you want to prevent that incident from happening again and I think that you know the dis- towards like how to keep your family members safe grows from that kind of a opening. Yeah. And then to say, let me help you, you know, if you have any questions about your recipe or the ingredients, I'm happy to help you find them or give suggestions into which brands or which, you know, types of recipes. I'm happy to help you and be willing to make a little extra. I always brought like a main dish for my kids and a dessert for the potluck so that they pretty much have their complete meal as needed. Yeah, I like how you say what what dish do you want to share with the family to your kids so that they don't feel like they're excluded, but they're actually including everyone else in their eating experience. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're not the only one with the like plate of food that looks completely different. Yeah, so I yeah, that's what I would do. Yeah, so that they always feel like they have something special for them at these gatherings. So what advice would you give for other moms that are from different cultural backgrounds that kind of want to start doing what you did and start creating blog and recipe resource for other parents? You know, it's a two-pronged approach. So one thing is that you might want to think about what is your favorite dish? Yeah, something that you really totally completely miss eating. And then having some ideas about what you want to make is really helpful. And then secondly, sourcing safe ingredients for your culture. So for example, uh, stir fries are really important and very basic for making Chinese food, for example. And the four ingredients 
ingredients that you need to make stir fry are always soy sauce, sugar, maybe oyster sauce, and cornstarch. You can even leave out the oyster sauce, but some sort of sauce, a little bit of sugar, a little bit of cornstarch. And if you can find those four items that are allergy safe, then you can make almost any Asian recipe. And I think that just finding the, figuring out what is the minimum that you need. And then you can add other things. My stir fry, sometimes I'll add a little rice wine. Sometimes I'll add a little white pepper. Sometimes I'll add a little oyster sauce. Sometimes I'll add a little sesame oil. If like if it's, you're not allergic to oyster sauce or sesame oil, then those are things you can add it into it to make it taste different. But essentially, it's still stir fry. It always will have cornstarch. It will always have a touch of sugar and it'll always have a little bit of soy sauce. When I first launched my recipe blog, my most favorite food in as a first recipe, and that was chung fun. It's a dim sum recipe with a rice noodle roll and there's like a little beef inside. That's like my favorite. When I was a child, I decided this is my last supper. This is going to be, if I had to be stranded on a deserted island, this is the thing I'm going to eat for the rest of my life. And so that's what I put on my blog as my very first recipe. <laughs> I'm going to start with my last meal. <laughs> uh, so that's how you start with your favorite dish you start with your safe basic ingredients to make your dish and then you've practiced making it so if you know that you have this special holiday coming up in january i would start practicing in september and i would make it once or twice a month up until the holiday until i've perfected this recipe and then i'm really happy to share with my family look i know how to make this dish that's so beautiful and i'm curious actually because you know some people might want to share some of their recipes, but they don't want to create a whole blog. So do you ever have people share their recipes um, with you so that you can share it with other people since you already have such a big Asian cuisine following? I do, actually. I've had a total of two guest bloggers, which is, you know, kind of sad on my part. But one of them is actually a recipe by a friend. And she had made these Korean donuts made from, I think, sweet potatoes. And uh, it's like her favorite. And she was so proud of them. I'm like, would you like to share that recipe on my blog? And she's like, yes. You know, she just jumped at the opportunity. And I was so happy that she did that. And I actually would like more people to share their recipes, but sometimes it just takes a little extra time to find people who would want to do that and to have them share the recipe and take a picture and do all these different things. It's a little bit challenging, but you know, I'd be open to it if people would let me know that they have a really awesome recipe that they want to share. So all of your recipes are the top eight allergen free or they defer? They're all nut free because that's the allergens that my family avoids at this time. And then some of them are going to be naturally egg free. Some of them are naturally dairy free and some of them are naturally allergy free of other allergens. So, you know, whatever it's free of, I call out. And then sometimes, for example, if a recipe uses soy sauce, you know, I have a recipe for how to make a soy free soy sauce substitute. And so it's so super easy to just substitute if you're allergic to soy to just use a soy free soy sauce and just do a one to one substitution. Yeah, there's like other recipes where I might use oyster sauce, but it's totally okay to omit it and it'll still taste just as good. Great. And then you highlight all of those little tricks in your blog. Yeah, totally. I love how you have really embraced this cultural aspect and that's like, that's what your blog is about. And I love that. And I actually have the Chung Fong recipe bookmarked. <laughs> Um, because that was my favorite thing as a child. No way! 100%. I was like, if I, have to, if I could ever eat any dim sum, it would be that. And I just got coconut aminos for the first time. And I was like, I feel like I can finally make it. Because my favorite part of the whole dish was always just drowning everything in soy sauce. So it was like swimming in soy sauce. So now I feel like I can finally make it. So when I do, I'll share it. And we'll definitely share that recipe with everyone else. Yeah, that sounds good. You know, like uh, coconut aminos is actually perfect for dipping the chonglan in because it has it's slightly sweet. So you don't even have to make um, the special sauce for 
uh, mahi eating chongfan because the coconut aminos is just ready for dipping. Yeah, it's perfect. And it's, you know, it's really nice that there are so many alternatives to get into eating Asian, like finding those alternatives, like you said, like soy sauce, that's an essential for Chinese food. So if you can find your version, your safe version, if you can create that, or if you can find something like coconut aminos, that's a great way in. And that's also something you can share with your family to say, look, we can still enjoy our cultural foods, just have to do it a little bit differently. It will taste very nice. It might not taste as authentic as you have planned, but at least everyone can share this experience together. It's just a little bit varied. Yeah. And it, that's so completely true. In fact, I was thinking about how when our, um, our family members immigrated to the United States, you know, they didn't have access to the ingredients they use back home. And so they improvise. And, and just like them, you know, they improvised because their food were not their special foods or their favorite foods were not available. So they improvised just like them. We improvise because of allergies and, you know, we just pretend that that food's not available. So what do we do? So I, I think that there's nothing different from what our par- grandparents or our parents did when they first came to the United States. I think that's a really beautiful way of looking at it, actually, to say, oh, you know what? Like they came with their culture and they had to make variations and work maintaining our culture and because of our food allergies we have to make slight variations but it doesn't mean it's not authentic and it doesn't mean you're not having that experience it just means you're making it available to yourself and to your family in a different way right exactly it's it's the same thing but you know just a slight mind shift reframing it so you don't feel like you're missing out on your culture yeah absolutely and actually you know i really like the idea of you know thinking of ways to take some of that pressure off of living with food allergies and and shifting our mindset from focusing in on the food and what we can't have to focusing in on what we can have. And one of the strategies that I had when my kids were first diagnosed, because, you know, with 30 allergens, it was extremely overwhelming. So I made a list. You know, these are the foods we can't even be in the same room with. These are the foods that we cannot eat. These are the foods that we're not sure about. And then these are the foods that we can have. And I tried to make that list of foods that we can have as long as possible. So that way, you know, I felt like, you know, we could eat more foods than we cannot eat. And, and that really helped me to kind of form a menu because like, what do we eat? We have food allergies. And I'm like, wait a second. We have this list of 100 different foods that I can make meals from. So I just mix and match. You know, it's like choosing your own adventure, but with food. I love it. It's playing within the rules of your food allergies. And there's so much you can do. And sometimes having those rules makes it more fun. That's how I see it, at least. And then the other thing about, you know, celebrating Uh, our culture with our family is that there's more to it than just food and we can totally shift our mindset from food to just the experiences and traditions of being with the family and the people that you love. And so you can focus in on non-food traditions like crafts and activities and games, dances, music. And then you can also create your new traditions and incorporate some of the things that are going on in our culture where we are at currently. So like you can do selfie backdrops because everybody loves a selfie, right? You can do board game tournaments and you can spend the time to interview grandma or somebody and and, um, and just make it as fun as possible. A lot of times people see culture and they just think of food immediately, but there is so much more to experience. And I agree, talking to grandma, you don't know what she's going to say or what you're going to learn. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that was such good advice. And I feel like coming into the holiday season that's the kind of advice that everybody wants to hear. I feel like I've learned so many little tricks of the trade from both of you guys. And it's just fun to hear that there are ways to make these events special and not feel like you're missing out on anything. Definitely. You definitely just have to reframe it. And thank you so much for sharing your tips, Sharon. Oh, you're welcome. It's so fun talking to both of you. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, just this conversation is making me look forward to the holidays so much more. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Remember that all information you hear today is for informational purposes only and are not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation, diagnosis, and or medical treatment of a qualified physician or healthcare provider. 
And also don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. And if you have a second, help spread the word by rating our podcast and sharing with your friends and family who might also be interested in learning more about allergies, asthma, and immunology. You can always stay up to date by checking out our Instagram, The Itch Podcast, where you can leave questions you are itching to know, or check out our website, which is www itchpodcast.com, which contains more information about the subjects we covered in today's episode and every episode. Until next time, have a fabulous week.